Write in the mail, MS sex games from Japan. Collecting without fail, those shoot 'em ups, and that's the plan. He doesn't just collect them, he also codes them too. Join us and we'll go on electric adventures with you. Hey YouTube, Electric Adventures here with my monthly update for January 2020. Uh, yes, a month's gone of the year already. Um, I, as I do in these ones, I have um, a couple of pickups that I haven't covered in another video, and yes, my video content has still been a little light this month. Um, I also haven't had many pickups. So the first thing I got, which was only just after the last video, was this neat little device. Um, this is an, ex um, an extra cord that comes with it. But this little device plugs into the cassette port of a, um, a Spectre Video 318 or 328, uh, either a Mark 1 or Mark 2, and has an audio socket. So then you go from an audio socket um, to your computer or even just your MP3 player or other audio device, allowing you to hook a normal tape drive up to a Spectre Video. Spectre Videos have a custom cassette port. Um, and it even comes in this nice little 3D printed case. So I'll put a link down below to, um, you need to join the Spectre Video uh, Facebook group, but the Spectre Video Facebook group, and there is a guy who has, um, he made an initial batch, and everybody was so interested in them, he's made a lot more. So they are available, not very expensive, and a very professionally done job. Um, I haven't played with it much yet though, but it does work really well. I need to make an actual video on, on using it, I just haven't had the time. And also, by chance, would have it, Spectre Video related. Um, my local mate, uh, Gary, he only dropped it over a couple of days ago, and he dropped in this Spectre Video expansion card, a 16K expansion card. Now these go in, the, there are two different models of a Spectre Video made lots of add-on hardware for their systems. Um, now this goes in a Super Expander, and there are two different versions of those. Um, and that's why the la and this label sits out so you can see it. Um, they're quite large cards. There's not obviously not a lot on this one, and this one's very similar to the to the um, 64K expansion card you can get. But this one was very useful for 318 owners because they also brought out a mini expander. So I already had this. Um, so what you do is you plug the mini expander in the back of your Spectre Video, and then you can plug in a card, as long as it's not the disk drive controller card, and you know, use it in the back of systems. This is a way of making a 318, which only had 16K of main RAM, up to 32K, which would basically make it be able to run all the games um, that the 328 had. Even though the 328 had 64K, not, I don't think there were any games at all that used all of that. Um, so it's just another useful addition to the um, hardware collection. I also came with the manual. The manual was dual purpose. It covered both the 16 and the 64K RAM modules. It's got its little limited warranty thing in there as well. Um, usual, sorry, you get some bad light there. Always came with very good instructions with photos and diagrams um, telling you about how to, you know, access the memory. Um, the um, 64K one came with little um, switches so you can select which bank it goes into. The 16K one you don't have a choice. Um, so they actually show dip switches. So this is one of the, yeah this is one of the ones that is hardwired. There must be another version of it that actually has dip switches, unless that's only the AG, because they're showing dip switches and talking about the um, 318 as well. Oh no no, they're talking about the 64K card. So only 64K card has dip switches, and they show a full memory map. So the memory of the Spectre videos were the precursors to the MSX. Um, and their bank memory bank structure is a little bit simpler to with what they decided to make it a bit more complicated for the MSX, which is good, which allowed the MSX a lot larger capabilities. 
um, and also a switch in smaller banks, whereas the Spectra Video really can do um, 32K banks. And you don't really have a lot of choice um, in which banks you can switch in and out. So you've got, got um, three main banks and you can switch the upper and lower pages. Um, in MSX you can actually have ex each one of those four banks can actually be expanded up to four times as well allowing giving you a space um, basically a four megabyte memory space in the end um, and there's a whole lot of bus signal so a lot of technical information Spectrogator was always very good with both their hardware and the technical information that came with them so that is basically all of my pickups but um, in a second way, you can see the blue um, arcade cabinet behind me. That is my Press On Play Pod Tapes um, uh, fellow cast member, Aaron's, um, <clears throat> and I'm babysitting it for him. Um, but he dropped around some Samwa joysticks because uh, it had those black bat joysticks in it, which none of us particularly like. Um, and I, um, I've installed those and got it all wired up, and now it plays. Uh, I've just got the uh, horizontal 19 in 1 in there at the moment, so I play as Robotron and um, Gradius, they're probably the two games that I've been playing in it, um, really, really well. Um, <clears throat> I also, in my Toot and Calm cabinet, which is the one slightly closer there, I said I'm going to grab the camera and I'm going to have a look in a second, I wired up the third button to the flash bomb, so in Toot and Calm, um, button A fires left, button B fires right, and the third button which a normal Konami adapter doesn't cover, um, does your once a level flash bomb, which is your get out of trouble thing. And I found it a little difficult to progress in the game. Um, I mean, my scores are getting better, uh, but just sometimes you need that flash bomb to get out of a sticky situation. All right, so what I'll do, let's grab the camera and go for a little walk and um, have a closer look at those machines and my progress. Right, so these are my working arcade machines. So we have my sit-down <coughs> um, Leisure and Allied uh, cabinet with two buttons that's currently um, jammer re rewired and it has my space pilot board in it. I do have a real-time pilot board as well. That works well. Monitor works really well. My Galaxian is still a long way in progress. Um, I do have a working clone board. The main board still needs some more work. I've got to rework the monitor, so more to do there. So this is Aaron's um, Australian built, currently labelled Mortal Kombat 2 upright. They're a very nice cabinet, very easy to work inside with a nice metal control panel, obviously not labelled or anything like that. Nice big screen, does need a degaussing. Uh, this has just got a 19 in 1. 19 in 1s are always a little bit less, shall we say, clear than real boards. Um, I do have a couple of horizontal boards, you know, like I could put my prehistoric aisle board in there as an example, but I like playing Robotron at the moment. Now I put these Sanwa joysticks in that Aaron brought around, and they have quite a nice feel. Um, uh, everything is all properly secured in and everything like that, and it works well. Um, and I've, uh, I didn't have any more coin-up buttons, so I've just got a the old uh, micro switch hanging out a non-permanent hole to put credits in and um, I've got a little bit of wiring to clean up so basically my my agreement with Aaron if I was going to stall this for him I was allowed to fix it so because I don't want a machine sitting there that I can't play so next we have my mini upright which I've been converting into a um, mini toot and calm now I've I've just been playing with the monitor. I've turned the brightness down a little bit, and I want to turn up the um, dials on the actual uh, neck next. Um, there is a little bit of a noise coming out of the speakers, so I say we've just got a couple of capacitors on the Tutankham board that need addressing, and sometimes um, you'll lose all of the brightness in the picture. It's nothing to do with the monitor. It is definitely a board issue, but it is playable. Uh, all the buttons work now, and most importantly, the flash. Um, gotta love that sound. So you got shoot right, shoot left, and once per level, flash. So with this brightness and everything like that, it's very hard to film that screen. So you're not getting it is lovely and clear, 
Um, but um, yes, not the easiest to film in, without me turning off the lights. So we'll leave that one going. So next is my Berserk cabinet, uh, work in progress. I have two board sets. Um, I, I have got it booting further, but I do believe uh, we're suffering from um, some of the connectors between all the boards. They're very brittle. Um, so my next thing is to try replacing those. Just haven't got around to that. Once again, requires getting the ribbon cables and the connectors and all that sort of things. Just haven't done it yet. Then we go to my Bosconian um, screen. Um, uh, isn't too bad. It's nice and clear. <clears throat> it's just it could do a bit of a brightness adjustment. Also, we only have just a sheet of glass over here. We really need a sheet of perspex to cut down. As you can see, the reflections are, are atrocious. This is an old Nintendo cabinet, a Space Firebird Nintendo cabinet. Um, what I wanted to do with this is take this control panel out and save it. I don't want to destroy the original, but I want to build a Bosconian uh, um, uh, control panel that I can pop in there with its own labelling and then I can switch the machine back and forth. I still do want to try and take this paint off the sides and yeah, I just haven't got, I need to get the right chemicals and things like that and give it a try because it'd be interesting to see whether we can get the space firebird back. We only have a really cheap bezel and really cheap marquee in here, so proper ones of those would be great. Uh, same with the Tutankhamun. gum, and I want to get a proper um, marquee done, but I'll need to design one that fits in the smaller space. This is my Frankenstein cabinet that's got a, a Neo Geo MVS in it. Um, Gary actually mentioned the other day that you may have a proper um, control panel I could switch this out with. So I may have to trade with Gary and get that off him and then uh, this has just got a TV in there. It's, it's not, not, it's probably a bit too um, oversaturated at the moment uh, but take it out of its um, case properly mount it and maybe build a either a cabinet like that or maybe build a true Neo Geo replica cabinet. That'd be great. I can't seem to find one to buy so um, yeah, why not? Now, last thing is, is this is my original, very first cabinet that I got, which is a um, uh, B and M coin amusements, but it was a leisure and allied cabinet. Um, quite a few of them around here. Uh, quite a nice arrangement, comfortable controls, a little bit of wear on it, but it's not too bad. And it did actually come with Twin Cobra. Um, but probably about a month after I got it, Twin Cobra stopped working, um, and then. Um, I just put other games in it for a while and didn't get around to that. And then the monitor went for a while and then I got that fixed. Um, now it does still have this problem with the monitor. If you look really closely, once it warms up you get these vertical lines. Um, so I believe since I sent the chassis off to get serviced, um, previously we might have wound the neck up too much. So we need to back that off and then turn up the main brightness. But other than that it actually displays a nice picture, but the most important thing is, is I obviously got Twin Cobra working. So I basically wrote myself a list of easy things to fix in the, in the um, in my arcade collection. I've written other lists for the rest of the game room as well. And one of them was take Twin Cobra out of the arcade cabinet and try it on my workbench. And also clean up my workbench. So I've cleaned up my workbench, I plugged Twin Cobra in, and it worked. And I went, oh. Uh, but then I knocked the um, the uh, the harness and it reset and then after a little while it went to a test pattern and I went aha right so something wrong with the connection and this cabinet does have a really tight jammer harness it's actually very difficult to put on it's, you know it's almost like it's just that little bit too small um, so I basically used PCB cleaner on the connector and lots of elbow grease plugged it in again and it worked perfectly on the test bench and I couldn't get it to reset, so I thought, all right, I'll come back and try it in the cabinet. Brought it back here, plugged it in, and it worked first go. And then I started playing it and realised I'm absolute rubbish at this game. And also realised it was still on hard, as of course I bought this off an operator and they were trying to maximise their credits. So, I've put it on the default settings, which is still not easy. Um, and I can get slightly further, obviously no high school save or anything like that. But um, it's a good fun game, very hard. Um, I do believe the difficulty is very much tailored to the twin part of it, which is two players. Um, but another enjoyable vertical um, scrolling shooter that's um, not too bad and reminds me of Raiden. And my Raiden arcade board is... Uh, the sound's not working on it, so if 
I didn't have Twin Cobra, I'd have Raiden in here. So, I am very pleased with my arcade roundup. I do have my original Space Invaders here, which is currently my table that I use for putting stuff on. That's almost working as well. I have my high score saver to put into the Bosconian and um, service a couple of caps on that to make sure that it lasts. So, plenty more little projects that I can do without having to spend too much money. All right, back to me. Right, I hope you enjoyed that quick look at those machines. They're definitely progressing. Um, obviously, as I said, the um, Tutankham <coughs> monotone needs a little bit more adjustment. Um, but other than that, the Tutankham machine is really up to the stage where I need to dress it up and get um, you know proper control panel art done and uh, a marquee done at the very least. Um, maybe might be able to figure out something to go around the bezel. We'll wait and see. Because I'd like to dress it up as if it was a Tutankham cabinet, even though it's a mini cabinet and isn't the original size. So we'll have to uh, make my own artwork and then get it printed and see how we go. Um, I'll do that as as budget uh, and things go um, and um, and probably the the next thing I'll move on to is my um, space invaders cabinet that is almost working I said I've written a list of easy things to do so I don't get distracted by the, um, the next thing coming in and once you get the space invaders working I'll probably move back onto my berserk cabinet which is also very close I have lots of parts it's just a matter of diagnosing um, I probably just have to replace the ribbon cables in between the boards and between all the boards that I have I can surely get it fully working. It's getting a fair way through the boot sequence. Um, now I didn't get any new movies this month um, but I did watch some of the ones I got at Christmas and I did get a lot at Christmas. Um, so I thought I'd just very quickly go over them and um, tell you what I thought of them. So I watched X-Men Dark Phoenix um, a movie that everybody pretty much panned um, and I did enjoy it in its own right it is definitely not a perfect movie um, it's probably not how I, I know I mean, I'm going to do this with no spoilers I probably know some of the things that um, uh, most annoyed people who watched it uh, but I still enjoyed it as a movie and it was worth me watching because I've watched the other X-Men movies in the series now also, a caveat here, I never, even though I, when I was running my comic store was, was when the X-Men comics first came out, I never really read them myself. A lot of my customers at the time were into them, so I sort of, I suppose, I know about the X-Men universe, so I'm familiar with the characters, but I'm not totally invested in the story in the, in the comic books or anything like that. So, um, deviations from things that have come, you know, been in the comic books and things like that don't annoy me, I just watch the movie for the movie's sake, and it was it was all right. Um, so don't always, uh, you know, take whatever uh, what the critics say at face value. Sometimes, so you know, you've got to try things yourself. Now, the next one I watched, and I really thoroughly enjoyed this one, was Alita: Battle Angel. I've actually wanted to watch that one for ages, never got a chance to see it in the pictures, um, and it was a 4K only. Um, so I couldn't watch it on my projector, but we do have a 4K TV and watched it on that. Um, I do occasionally have a little bit of audio lag issue, uh, which was fine at the start of the movie. We got interrupted, I had to pause it in the middle, and then we got audio lag, so it took me a while to work it out. So, but even with that interruption, it didn't spoil um, the enjoyment of watching that movie. I have been a fan of the comic for a while, so once again, back to the, the link to the comics there. Um, and it has been one that I have uh, followed and enjoyed. Uh, they're obviously trying to compress a lot of story into one movie and I really do hope they go on and do uh, the next movie or movies that follow on and continue the story because um, of course there is more to tell in that one. But if you're in a manga fan, and I do like one of the statements that um, it's the, not that it's a very high bar to beat but it is definitely the best western adaptation of a Japanese manga title. Uh, there are some very good non-Western adaptions of manga titles that could ignore in stats like that, but pretty much every other Western one has been a bit of a dog's breakfast. Um, but that one definitely was um, very well done, captured the characters very well, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And next, so this is my definitely favourite movie of the month, and is John Wick 3, um, and 
it was uh, at some stages during that movie my heart was um, beating faster and it fully drew me in it was a fantastic um, sequel to the other movies and I so much so that we're going to organize a movie night where we're going to watch all three of them together with no breaks because they do continue immediately um, you know th immediately after the other one finishes um, and it's um you know, uh, the actual story and premise, it has enough interest to keep you going. You're there for the action and the stunt choreography, which was amazing. Um, you also, um, if you get a chance, you should check out Keno's training uh, run he did with Halberry. Um, it's up on YouTube. It's popped up on my feed a couple of times. Uh, that is uh, very interesting. And it shows how much effort they all put into training for this and it's just you go oh my god it just it doesn't stop it um, all the way through uh, just a brilliant entertaining movie you have to like the genre of course but um, yeah I really did and then to cap it out the other one that we watched was Ad Astra um, which is the one with Brad Pitt um, it was alright it annoyed me in a couple of places because it ignored sights um, I don't think there's a lot of... You can ignore science and science fiction as long as you have a MacGuffin which is something to explain it away. Like, as an example, The Expanse is extremely uh, scientific accurate, except we don't have the drive they've got in there. But they explain that somebody invented it and solved the problem, and that feeds into all the other physics, so it makes sense. But in Ad Astra, they broke the laws of physics lots of time and didn't explain themselves and it just spoiled the feel of the movie in a couple of places. Um, and although it was, it was all right, it was interesting, I would actually like to follow up and maybe find the story that it's based on and read it. I think that, that would be worth doing. Um, the movie just didn't quite, you know, I've watched it and, um, you, know, you know, I'm glad that I've watched it, but I'm probably not going to be rewatched that one. Uh, or not for a very long time, so uh, a little bit of disappointment there with that one. Um, but yes, anyway, that's not too bad, and from all the movies I've got, so I've still got uh, Hellboy and Apollo 11 out of those discs that I got for Christmas to watch. Um, we don't try and watch everything at once, we just we have a movie night maybe once a week sometimes. Um, so I'll get through those this month. Um, and uh, yes, very hard with all the lovely new TV shows coming out. Um, what is it? This is not a TV review channel, so maybe I should <laughs> do other episodes just to review all of the lovely TV shows that have come out. Uh, next, um, I'm sure a lot of you are interested, is um, Homebrew Update. I actually finally got to have a proper break over Christmas, and um, as I've mentioned before, we've had some health issues in the family, so we've all gotten back into eating better, uh, exercising regularly. Um, and I believe it's allowed me to focus more on things and relax. And I sat down and I had a really nice session um, back on Berserk for the ColecoVision. Um, and I made some quite good progress. So hopefully there's a bit of a thing here. There's also another video I released separately if you missed that one. Berserk is coming along really nicely. I'm really pleased with my progress on it so far and it should not take much longer to finish off. Um, it might take a bit of mucking around to get the speech samples to where I'm happy with them because we uh, I'm dealing with the original Coleco sound chip and it is very limited. Um, I can only do the speech by sound modulation. Um, so it's it's going to it's the speech it's going to be speech is going to be coarse but um, it's um, you know it, it should give you the reasonable feel of the arcade game and I'm pleased that the actual gameplay is feeling you know, quite reasonably like the arcade game so far. Um, so not much more to do with that one, and I'm hoping um, during this week and next weekend I can get another couple of sessions just to finish off all the gameplay mechanics so I can totally focus on, you know, the sound effects um, and the speech and just all those little things like high score table and things like that, just to get the game finished off. Um, so I'd really like to get that to uh, beta testing in the next couple of weeks. Uh, speaking of that, um, Cavern Fighter, which I told you about last month, um, beta testers have been reasonably quiet. Um, they have found one bug, um, 
which I will address in uh, the next week and send it back out to the guys. So that one shouldn't be too far off from being released as well. So even though I've probably waffled a lot in this episode, um, I would like to do a video response to my good friend Novabug. Uh, now, probably uh, one and a half years to 18 months ago, he quite regularly ran a series called The Friday Foursome, where he asked a question with um, four different answers, um, and it encouraged people to do video responses, and I really like encouraging um, community on YouTube rather than just you know sit and watch. It's great to participate and respond to other people's videos. YouTube haven't made that easy with the, the systems, but now that we've got you know Facebook pages and all other things that we can link things together to do the functionality we lost in the YouTube, it doesn't stop us from doing video responses. So I'll put a link to um, Novabug's original video down below and feel free to go and make a video response yourself. So the particular question, so this is Friday Force from number 22, so you've got 21 episodes to go back and watch to catch up if you haven't seen any of those. And it's an alternative retro choice. So this is basically going back to the systems that uh, we got where we're all growing up. And if we didn't choose the particular one that we bought, what's another one that we could have chosen and bought at the time? Um, just ignoring financial situation because sometimes the reason why we got a particular machine was because of financial situation so if the situation for you know you, you had the money at the time and you could pick a different system also based on hindsight and what you know now as well uh, which one would you have picked all right um, so the caveat here is when I was younger I didn't own a lot of systems so we're gonna have to deal with the ones that I had um, and uh, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll just work our way through it and, and see how we go. Um, I believe I have four that I can swap. Um, it does it does make it a little difficult because my very first console was a Pong console, so um, and there wasn't a lot around at the time when I got the Pong console because that was before the Atari 2600. Uh, I've never owned an Atari 2600 back, uh, as my own. I used to go around to my friend's place and play it. Then after that, even when the um, the ColecoVision and stuff had come out, that was around the computer era. So I start. I'll, I'll probably primarily have to stick with computers. So let's go with my very very first computer, which was a TI ninety nine slash four that was supposed to come with the extended basic cartridge. Um, I bought that off somebody second hand as they were upgrading to a TI ninety nine four A. Um, and they stiffed me, they didn't give me the extended basic cartridge, so I only had that basic machine. So around that time, you're probably looking at the alternatives that I could buy in a shop. I'm going to limit to the ones that I could buy in Australia in a shop. So it probably would have been a ZX81, <clears throat> which probably would have led on, you know, further up the spectrum path later. Um, it's a very difficult choice. Would I have actually got a ZX81? Or maybe, at that time, I probably would have got a, um, an Atari 800. There we go. Instead of the original TI-99-4, I reckon I would have got an Atari 800. I did play them and love them in, um, in the store that I worked in later. Um, and uh, I loved pouring over the catalogues and... And actually, probably, you know, that time, it was probably would have been an Atari 400, the one with the rubber keyboard and things, because that's what I would have been able to play. And I used to love the brochures that showed the, um, you know, Pac Man and all the games on it and how they were that much better than the Atari 2600. So there we go. Number one choice is the Atari 400. So I said, I'm doing these live, I haven't really thought about them um, before the question. So, number two system. So the next system that I got after the TI-1994 was my beloved Spectre Video 3 and 8. Uh, but at the time when I was choosing that, my choices were a VIC-20 with an extra, I believe, 8K expansion card that the guy was going to throw in, um, or a Micro B. Uh, but the reason why that didn't get picked was I couldn't afford the colour model, which was an extra $100.00. I could only afford the black and white model, which was the old one, and I really wanted colour because I'd had a colour computer already. Um, and then we'll throw in a third one here. 
just probably about the time when I said yes, I'm going to buy the Spectre Video 318 and the local store that I helped out in and everything like that, he offered, uh, he basically knocked $100 off the Spectre Video, which put it back into contention. So I got it from $299, it got it down to $199, which is the same price as that Vic 20. Um, and the Micro Beef, I believe, was still $250 black and white. Um, was the Sega SC. 3000, so rubber keyboard exactly like the 318 um, uh, would have come with no games, would have just come with basic, um, but it had Star Jacker, which was fantastic, and Congo Bongo. They're the first two games I played for the, um, the original Sega SC3000. Uh, but I already said yes to the other one, and I thought, well, you know, there's only those two games, I don't see much else, I don't know much about this machine. And I'd painstakingly gone through and, um, you know, chosen the um, Spectre Video 3 and 8 because on, on the games that I saw and and uh, the programming, the ability of the basic to program and everything like that. So there we go. At the last um, second, I probably could have switched and ended up with a Sega SC3000. Uh, and that's the plain model. Rubber keyboard, there's a H model later that has a full travel keyboard later. And that's probably where I would have gone after that. Right, so after the Spectre Video 3 and 8, I got a Spectre Video 3 to 8. Uh, we won't count that one, otherwise we're going to run out of things. But then let's switch to MSX. So from the Spectre Video, I, my next step was to go into the uh, into MSX, which obviously don't regret at all. Um, but at the same time, um, the Commodore 64 started to get really, really big. Really, really big. Lots of people. So when it first came out, Commodore 64 was very expensive. It was six hundred dollars, um, and it actually flopped. Uh, but then they lowered the price and started to compete, and then it started to sell and sell in big numbers. Um, and I always used to go and hang out at one of the local stores and play games on it. Paradroid, I think I previously mentioned, is one of the games that I previously played lots and lots of. Um, and of course, Iridium. And lots of other games, even you know, things like Beachhead and all the and Impossible Mission. They're all th sort of games that I would have loved playing back in the day. And I would have ended up on a different side of the programming fence too. So I wouldn't have ended up with a Z80 machine. I would have had a 6502. So I would have started doing 6502 assembly programming earlier, perhaps. Who knows? Especially with the very limited basic that's built into a Commodore 64, because they, they pretty much didn't change their basic since. They bought it off Microsoft for the PET, then used it in the VIC-20 and then the 64. So it would have pushed me towards machine code, um, machine code assembly a lot earlier, I reckon. All right, so that's my third machine. So what's in the fourth generation? <clears throat> now, this is a bit of a cheat because I did actually ha own um, both machines in the next generation. So after doing the Spectre video and doing the MSX, all machines are loved, but the next machine, I wanted to make sure that I was making the right choice once again. It was going to be a great environment for me to program in. You remember I was getting to the more advanced stage of programming now. I knew assembly language. I'd started to learn C. Um, and, um, you know, I wanted something, a good platform. So I researched. Um, I saw the Atari ST for when it first came out. I don't know, you know, it was pushed as a monochrome monitor, a bit of an alternative to the Max desktop publishing and things like that. That was the very first model. Um, had an external disk drive, done an internal disk drive. Um, the Amiga 1000s had been out, but they were way too expensive, way for, too much for me to buy at the time. Um, but I really, then the Amiga 500 came out, and I thought, right, this is a way for me to get an Amiga. So I went and bought one. <coughs> um, pretty much all of my money at the time bought that. Uh, a copy of a game called Garrison, which is like a gauntlet clone, and another shoot 'em up that escapes me for the moment. Took my 500 home, and the mouse stopped working almost immediately. And I went, oh, great. So I went back, um, they uh, swapped, gave me another mouse, took it home, played it for another four days, and then the disk drive stopped working. And this really started, you know, I mean, I understood how hardware worked and everything like this, and this was going, oh, this is just as bad as when they brought out the Commodore 64s, and, you know, um, three out of four of them failed and stuff like that, <coughs> which is what happened. That's why there are six hardware models of the Commodore 64. 
it took them ages to get it right, they were very unreliable. People often forget about that. Why so many people spend, as much as they love the machines, why so many people spend so much time fixing them nowadays. Um, so I was a bit scorned. I really liked the Amiga and its hardware, so I ended up taking it back, getting my money back, and from the store I worked at, I bought an Atari SD, and I ended up on the Atari SD side of things. And didn't have another Amiga until a good friend of mine, when he upgraded to an Amiga 4000, gave me his Amiga 1000. So my Amiga 1000 in my collection over there is actually my oldest Amiga. But then quite a bit of time had passed then, and I was sort of, you know, mainly into PCs. So my last choice is I would have liked to have been able to keep the Amiga 500 in working condition and stayed on the Amiga side of the fence um, back then. Even though I used the Atari ST as a very productive machine, desktop publishing, assembly language, C, um, it would have been really nice to have experienced those things and the development environment on the Amiga side of the fence. So there we go. That's probably a very long-winded answer, but I enjoyed going through that question and um, telling you all about you know, what I would have done with that alternative choice back in the day. So, what are your alternate choices? Why don't you go check out Novabug's original video and do a video response yourself. Alright, I've probably done enough waffling for this month, so I'm Electric Adventures, thanks to all my subscribers, and I'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.